Welcome, Ecom Logistics Nation. Thank you for joining today's episode. We're on a mission to share e commerce logistics insights, trends, successes, and challenges from the leaders and innovators in our space. Find great partners, find great tools. It's going to help you in the long run. Don't write code for the sake of writing code. Welcome, Ecom Logistics Nation. To a unique episode, first of its time after one year in the uh, the podcasting seats, we're flipping the script today, and instead of asking the questions, we're putting ourselves in the hot seat. So we got our very own producer, Hashida, whose vision this was. She's the one that came up with the idea for the podcast, and it's been it's been an amazing go at it right now. Um, and she'll be grilling us on trending topics in supply chain world, so... Rashida, are you ready? Yes, of course. Can't wait, guys. Uh, but before we jump in, it's been a year. I mean, let's let's take a moment to reflect on that. We've had quite the journey. Uh, tell us, tell us, how does it feel? What has it been like for you guys? I tell you, after a year, when I look back, I think Nanad and I have been talking about doing this for probably five, six, seven years. I mean, yep. this goes way back. And I know, Harshita, you finally were the one that lit the fire and said, we got to do this. The time is now and uh, and got 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 the ship rolling. And I remember we we originally said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we put out one episode a month? We'll do 12 <laughs> episodes a year and, and that would be awesome. And then you kept pushing, rightfully so, pushing and saying, guys, we got to get more content out. And uh, and I think that's led to, to putting us in the position we're in today, which is just absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I mean, Dan and I had this opportunity in the past to work with a lot of brands go through a lot of warehouses, work on various different technologies and automation and whatnot. And you're gaining all of this knowledge, right? And we truly enjoy imparting the knowledge as well, right? Like going out and talking to people about it. Just this morning, I was on flight talking to someone for the 45 minute flight talking about warehousing and distribution with this individual, right? Fascinated, made a new friend uh, out of that person. And it's like, wouldn't it be cool if we do what we do in front of people? And we have had this where people have said, oh, if you had a podcast, I would listen to you. Like we have heard that before and wanted to do it. But there's this other thing as well that people say it, but you got to kind of realize it is you got to surround yourself with good people because I was the last person that would have actually started a podca- podcast to put in the effort to actually do it. I would have bought all the equipment, but <laughs> never been committed to actually making it happen. And with Arshida, with Nitya on the producer side as well, with Yael helping us, just these amazing people that we surround ourselves with that actually helped us make it happen. And to Dan's point, yeah, let's do one a month to let's do one a week <laughs> yeah. and consistently do it one a week. That's been an amazing journey. That has been phenomenal. So just looking back at it. And now we are talking about just, I don't know when or how it might come to fruition, but here, look at this. It's a new type of episode, right? Like where we aren't talking to someone else, we are internally having a conversation I think there is opportunities for other formats going forward, maybe other offshoot podcasts. Like it's, I think the, the opportunities are endless now that we know what we are doing. So this has uh, been an amazing one year. Absolutely agreed. And guys, I just have to say it's, uh, it's been easy enough for me to pull this off with the fact that you guys tend to have these conversations on a weekly basis anyways. It was just a matter of putting these fancy equipment in front of you and and the guests and actually capturing it. Because one of the reasons why I was so driven to make this podcast happen is because every time we get on calls and we're having these discussions, I'm like, we need to let other people listen into it as well. There's just so much gold. Um, and as, as all of us are kind of on the same page about having that abundant mindset, we wanted to share that with everyone. Um, and I also want to thank my team because I feel like without this being a team effort, like this is not a one person job. This is, uh, it really does take a village to make a podcast a reality. So, um, 
it's uh, it's truly them try making it happen. For me, it's just the execution fire. If you have something that needs to happen, come and tell me and I'll just bug everybody to make it happen. But the, the reality is, is quite different. And then the other thing I also want to call out is I really appreciate you guys messaging us and DMing and telling us, giving us your feedback, because that's also helped us a lot in terms of what you like to listen to more about and questions that you have or issues that you're struggling with, because we always try and integrate those into our podcast episodes and try and answer those for you. So as we are at this junction, trying to figure out additional formats, and uh, we have a couple of uh, new things planned for. Uh, offshoot podcasts, etc. Continue to give us that feedback. Continue to message us. Reach out. Let's. Uh, our goal here is to create the community where we can have this dialogue and open and help each other. So um, keep that in mind. And yeah, we're we're always here with you. Um, as Dan likes to call it, uh, the ecom logistics nation is strong. Yeah, exactly. And what's also interesting on that front is. Some of the folks, very early stage, uh, let's say episode 10, 15, right? Like they, they kind of reached out and be like, okay, but what's your, what's your focus audience here, right? Like, oh, you're talking to the chief supply chain officer of American Eagle. And then you're talking to a startup robotics company. And then you're talking to a warehouse operator at 3PL. You're talking to e-commerce, like digital marketing consultants, right? You're all over the place. And it's like, listen, this podcast is to be very honest, more about us getting educated and taking the opportunity. Podcast is a reason why you can invite people that you might not know and bring them to the table and have a conversation while you learn. And in the process, if others can, it's amazing. Our, the reach of what on a day-to-day -day basis that I do or we do, it crosses all of these segments. I might not go deep. I'm not trying to sell anything to anyone through the podcast, right? It's more about learning. That is where the opportunity exists for us. So it, it I think the formula has worked, what we have ended up doing. And yeah, some offshoots where we might have very distribution focused or very transportation focused, there is opportunities for that. But learning about e-commerce logistics end to end, and that includes post-click and pre-click transactions and everything that goes in between because what makes us good at what we do today is because we understand beyond logistics what happens before and what happens after right so that's where the opportunity happens to be and it's it's been an amazing run at learning different aspects of things out in the market yeah, that's a great point. And I think um, we should, one of the things I want to add is, I know Nanad hates this word, but we front loaded a lot of work in terms of just figuring out who are we making this podcast? How are we going to communicate? How do we make sure that we add value? Because obviously there are a lot of other podcasts in within the supply chain space. And one of the reasons why we have made it such slightly more diverse uh, audience or guests than you would you know, typically imagine is because it, it requires, you need to have that kind of breadth of experience and knowledge and insights to truly understand logistics and supply chain, because it is extremely complicated. There's just so many divergent thoughts that we've been able to kind of bring to the table. And I think that's, what's going to add to your, uh, the richness in terms of, uh, you knowing more about this industry. And the other thing is this industry is one that is constantly growing and evolving. So even though uh, some of these episodes might get dated in a couple of years, I think you will still be able to get a lot of uh, little gems that you can pick up in terms of here's how things are done. And um, all, all our guests have been phenomenal and so generous with their knowledge. So uh, if you've missed any episodes, I highly recommend going back and checking them out because this is what's going to give you that MBA without having to pay for that MBA uh, for your supply chain. Uh, I think uh, I agree with all of that. And <clears throat> I think, What's happened like post pandemic too is and, and early on before the pandemic too is just this massive amount of innovation. So these conversations we're having are to your point, they're disrupting what was the status quo. And in the world of supply chain, it still exists today, but you start seeing the silos between sales and technology and operations and finance all starting to kind of break down with this synergy across the board. So although our guests come from different aspects and with different expertise in supply chain, 
the important piece now is it's all starting to connect and uh, operate as one machine, which, which for me, someone who's been in it, like, like, like all of us, 20 plus years, it's really exciting and long overdue. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, just based on what you said, Dan, I think it might be worthwhile for us to do another follow up uh, episode. And I think just talking through some of these challenges that I was alluding to earlier, when people message us or reach out to us or DM us and tell us, hey, this is this is my challenge. I've been trying to move the needle on this specific type of uh, problems that they're facing. Would you be interested in hearing more about and perhaps you are having the same kind of issues and challenges? Maybe we can learn together and we can share some knowledge in terms of how we would approach the situation. Obviously, keeping in mind that everyone's um, environment and, and business is going to be slightly different, but perhaps like digging into those challenges because we're all in it together. And as supply chain industry kind of evolves and grows and uh, becomes better, we all become better with it. Love it. Amen. All right. So if you guys are ready now, I want to start off by asking you about what your thoughts are on the current state of supply chain. I mean, 2023 has been quite the year. Uh, A lot has happened. Tell us about your thoughts on the supply chain tech market and its valuation, current state of affairs. Uh, How how are you guys feeling? So maybe it makes sense to take one step backwards and look at like what 2020 20 and 2021 looked like where there was just a massive influx of M&A. The VC and private equity funding was at an all time high. And again, it was because the pandemic like showed all these cracks in supply chain and all this innovation was, was coming out. But for those that have been in the industry for a long time, a lot of us were scratching our head and we were saying, this isn't sustainable. This is actually feels like a Ponzi scheme a little bit um, where we, we would see acquisitions take place where the multiplier was in the high teens or 20s. And knowing the business like we know, we're, we were just saying to ourselves, this is not sustainable. Something is going to happen. So to answer your question, Harshita, something did happen. So um, as we kind of started out this year in the tail end of 2022, you started to see that the VC funding slowed down tremendously. Mm -hmm. Interest rates, macroeconomic conditions, a a lot of different factors where the layoffs started happening. Some of these tech companies started um, closing their doors. And it's sad, right? It's not something you want to see happen in the market, but we knew it was going to happen. And I think As that happened, and now you're seeing companies actually mature themselves at a faster clip, which is really good for the industry and good for these organizations and good for the funding that's coming into our space. So, um, yeah, I see good things. I think the there's some consolidation that's happened. There's a lot more niche specific focused where I think everyone was tra- chasing the dragon for a while and just trying to be all things to, to a lot of different people. Nanad, what are your thoughts, buddy? Well, I'll say this, right? I'll, I'll, I'll use a uh, Lord of the Rings reference, right? When um, the pandemic started, um, before that, right? Like during pandemic, there were all of these conversations of, um, uh, the focus wasn't on supply chain as much, right? Like it was all about the larger direct to consumer type applications or really large enterprise scale B2B applications where the VC focus was institutional large VC. And I call it the eye of Sauron, right? Like it, it kind of like moves and looks at what's happening in the market. And when pandemic happens, everyone starts talking about supply chain, the thing that you never knew that it makes the world go round et cetera, et cetera. Now it's forefront of the conversation. And the same thing ends up happening with institutional larger VCs coming in and dumping a whole bunch of cash in that environment, right? Versus the strategic VCs, because there is a lot of those, right? They sat back and said, okay, we are going to do a little bit. And they are the smart ones within this space because something someone just recently said to me was like, Nina, think about how many billion dollar exits have we seen in this market? Not many. You could probably count two, three, four, five, maybe, right? Depending on what you define as supply chain exits. That doesn't happen as often, right? Like, so it's a matter of this is not that industry. It's hard. Supply chain, physical supply chain is really, really hard to do. 
and to dominate within that market is even harder mm -hmm. because it's not like you can go take over 50% of the market share for a given thing, right? The competition is going to be right behind. Even the largest of warehouse management systems or order management systems or transportation enterprise grade systems don't occupy 50% of the market. That's just not this market. And I think that's where the realization kind of set in. And now we are dealing with reality as we look back at the early start of this year. Definitely there were concerns, major concerns with what's going to happen with the economy. It seems like it's all settled down. Everyone's not as concerned, at least not in the U.S., right? Like Canada, there, were, there are still concerns. I'll tell you about that. But on the U.S. side, it's kind of starting to settle back in. So what we are seeing is... Okay, we are rec we recovered from pandemic, all of these investments. Now we got to kind of take a step back. I think what's going to happen is 2024 will be the year of restructuring and growth, right? Like mm -hmm. there were a lot of companies that grew. There were a lot of companies that did not grow. I, I met someone this morning talking about GNC as a brand, right? GNC had so many store closures. They went to uh, file for bankruptcy. Right. They restructured, they came back. Now they are doing well enough that next year they are planning on just going opening a whole bunch of stores again. You know what I'm saying? So like the, the tide's about to turn again. Mm -hmm. No one can look at the, the crystal ball of the economy, but it seems like the fears have kind of subsided at this point and everyone's hyper focused on peak this year. I think peak's going to be really interesting this year. I mean, it's interesting every year, by the yeah, way. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Never a dull moment. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, one of the things that I feel um, in terms of the, the VC funding, so Dan, going back to the points that you made, um, there were some inflated valuations, right? And uh, over the last year, year and a half, we've seen those valuations and the outcome that it generated, there have been, not calling out any names, but there have been fire sales and things have kind of happened to... I think we are not going to see a pandemic like bubble. I don't like that type of bubble is not coming back. I think everyone got beaten up pretty hard this year, right? Like most of the companies, at least I'll say we keep talking about VCs, right? Like let's, let's put that aside. Let's talk about supply chain, right? Like that's what actually represents the market, right? And I got to say brands, they had to do a lot of readjusting as they saw the revenue drops the demand drops, et cetera. And the drop is actually normalization to what it used to be before. If you were to draw a straight line for growth curve and there was no pandemic in between, this is exactly where we would have been at this point. So given all the recessionary pressures, et cetera, we are actually doing really well. There is another way to look at this, right? So given that we would be on that growth curve, I think... Everyone has made the necessary adjustments or are in the process of making necessary adjustments, et cetera, to be able to get into a pretty decent 2023 peak and a pretty good looking 2024 healthier kind of outlook is what I, I feel. And so I, I don't think, I mean, yeah, there's bubbles outside of this, right? Like real estate as an example, we are not getting there, but uh, I, I don't think there is, we are in a bubble anymore. This is reality now is what I get a feeling, at least based on everything that I hear talking to brands and how people are actually operating. Yeah, I agree with that too. And I, I always try to look for leading indicators in, in some of the conversations that we're having. And if you go back a couple of years, the problems we have been solving were reactive right? We were reacting to a problem and we're coming in and we're, we're addressing, fixing and correcting. What has happened in the last several months as we're planning for 2024 with our with our clients and, and the industry is a lot of proactive planning. So those leading indicators where we see organizations start saying, okay, We've done our course correction. We've right-sized our problem. Now it's time to in invest very strategic, very prudent dollars to address whatever situation, whatever strategic initiative they have. Um, and 
we've been a part of a lot of those conversations where it's helping organizations right now uh, get their war chest ready mm-hmm. for 2024 and get their strategic planning dollars in place so that next year they could start on these initiatives and and start modernizing a lot of uh, digital transformation projects, a lot of optimization projects using robotics and automation and warehousing. So I'm very, I'm an optimistic guy by nature, but <laughs> these leading indicators are all pointing me to think that we've, we've gone through the worst of it. And, and now we're going to start seeing some really cool progressive progression, um, uh, solving these problems. Yeah. And I think if we were to maybe shift a little bit and look beyond to also the enterprise players, right? I know uh, we get to chat with them on pretty much a, a daily basis. So what are your guys' thoughts in terms of how the growth in the supply chain tech space um, is related to the enterprise players now leaning more into investing in supply chain software, whether it's developing it or buying more like updated software versus even the startup brands that Nanad, you were talking about, what kind of a balance are you seeing and has it changed over the last few years? I think the perspectives are very different. The kind of capital everyone sits on and the type of strategic initiatives and the workforce that you apply to actually achieve the goals that you have in front of you um, between startup brands or mid-market brands versus like large retail, large consumer goods, et cetera, type organizations. I'll tell you from a, a roller coaster standpoint, 2023 definitely was one, right? Like we start this year and it felt like, oh boy, <laughs> here it comes, right? And you could kind of see it through the conversations you are having at an enterprise level where it's like, yeah, everything's probably going to be on hold, but let's continue talking. And it's like, now everything's on hold. Now, why is it on hold? Because no one knows what's coming next, right? Mm -hmm. And then you go through Q2 with all of those pains and Q3, the the perspective starts shifting a little bit. And as we come to the end of Q3, enter in Q4, we are seeing almost like every conversation is like, let's go. We got to start investing. We got to start making the changes necessary for next year and the next five years. All of these things are going to hit us. AI is going to hit us, automation is going to hit us, our market's going to hit us. We got to be ready for it. And I think it's like we lost a duration out of fear. And it was a prudent business decision on everyone's part. Mm-hmm. And now it's almost like, all right, the purse strings are a little loose and let's just go. Let's get this done. So and, and what that's are what these- we are seeing. Sorry to interrupt, Nanad, but to keep you going on this thought, um, if I can ask you a follow up, um, what are these things or priorities or items that companies are flexing their budget muscles on? Like, is there a specific supply chain software that people are investing more into because they're trying to solve a specific kind of problem? Like, what is there anything interesting, any trends or something that you can, a little tidbit that you can share with the audience? Yeah, th- there is definitely post pandemic, like now everyone's rethinking uh, supply chain strategy in general of like specifically distribution nodes, mm. right? Like how do they address that? And I think all of that hype around MFCs and whatnot, now that we are, you know, that hype cycle curve, we are on the other side of it, right? Uh, the trough of disillusionment around MFCs as an example. Now the reality is kind of starting to sink in and folks are saying, okay, how do I need to restructure and redesign my network going forward Mm -hmm. What to align with consumer expectation and whoever you might be, right? Like you are seeing that. You are seeing things like CPGs wanting to, at a more rapid pace, get into e-com as an example, where they are saying, great, I'm working with retailers, but I need to start doing as a brand. I need to start doing more. And the retailers are more than happy giving them the options to say, yeah, be, be both a first party seller and a third party seller on my platform as an example. <laughs> now that requires a little bit of adjustment of how you design your supply chain, right? So you got that going on the tech side. We are seeing this renewed, no, I shouldn't say renewed, but this effort towards true digital transformation of moving into cloud-based systems, right? 
it's been kind of slow coming to that point. Enterprises mm. were really like, I was one of them right back in the days. We were like, cloud, I'll never <laughs> let my warehouse run on a cloud system because of information security, right? And now it's like, cloud's the option. That's literally what we should do. Now there is certain underlying fears that are still there. We're like, oh, will it perform well, et cetera, et cetera. And those things are starting to go away. So there is that transformation, right? Where it's like, I don't want to be thinking about upgrading my solutions every five years, right? Like mm -hmm. imagine people that have Salesforce today, they don't think about upgrading Salesforce mm -hmm. while most warehousing systems that run major warehouses today, they're saying, oh, I still have a 10 year old system or 15 year old. I wish I could do this. I wish I could do that. And it's like, nah, you don't need to think about it. You can now mm -hmm. go down that Salesforce level path of like, it's truly cloud. Right. I get all the greatest bells and whistles all the time. And that that same thing is applicable in transportation management systems, in order management systems, in ERPs, right? That cloud adoption is happening at a much greater rate. And <clears throat> anywhere I turn, I'm talking about upgrades or moving to the cloud as a very big thematic conversation. Mm -hmm. While doing mm -hmm. all of that, how do you differentiate yourself within the market, right? Like, so... Yeah, I can get the same cloud system as my competitor. Your true differentiation, right? Like from a disruption is going to come through what you build around it as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that companies are also starting to focus quite a bit on that. And, and that's where some of those strategic initiatives reside. I recently heard uh, some company doing just like development of microservices around their supply chain solution by spending $100 million within that environment. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the type of projects that we are starting to see in the market. Mm -hmm. Pretty impressive. Amazing. Yeah. It's a big shoe company. I don't know how much I could add there. <laughs> I think that was a great answer. But what I will say is what has repeated time and time and time again is following the expectations of the customer. So a lot of these initiatives, to Nanad's point, a lot of different system plays and, and, but at the end of the day, the why is because the consumer expectation continues to shift. Mm -hmm. And we thought maybe the Amazon Prime two day experience was going to maybe go away or stay or stick or whatever, but it's here to stay. So consumers are still looking for their goods at a very low cost or free, um, and fast, but if you take that away, because that's kind of a commodity, some of these projects that we're working on and helping organizations with is what does the customer want, right? They want visibility. It's also what Amazon has trained. Amazon has trained the consumer that when you go onto our marketplace, you're going to be able to see how many items are left. You're going to be able to see exactly when that delivery will take place if you order within the next so many minutes or so many hours. So that takes a whole heck of a lot of work to make happen. So that yeah. visibility through your entire supply chain and to go back to your, th the question at the enterprise level, you're working with a lot of legacy systems, right? Mm -hmm. Like Denod said, there's this transformation to the cloud, but a lot of the existing tech is, is legacy and it's been around for a long time. So that modernization to again, the why be able to give consumers visibility the way they want it, where they want it, I think is what's driving you know, a lot of uh, really, really amazing strategic initiatives and executive C level, board level priorities coming in, going into 2024. Yeah, great points. Um, just echoing everything that you guys said, I think this, uh, the last nine months or a year has given both enterprises and brands to just have that little bit of a time to reflect as they were kind of scaling back on spending extra money or starting new initiatives. They've had a time to tighten their budgets, tighten their belts and figure out what do my processes really look like? And I mean, we hear about automation projects all the time. And now we're hearing about folks trying to clean up their inventory systems. So it's almost like they're going back to, you know, the core aspects of their supply chain and tightening them up and adding automation as and when it makes sense. And it's not all just robotics. And some of it is just like going away from manual way of tracking things and manual way of performing processes and making it a little bit more automated, um, which again is worth the investment because this is something that can have the, the payback is throughout the, the life of that warehouse or, or that business. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you go back to 2005, a robot in a warehouse costs like $65,000. Right. A robot today is rat robot as a service, right? It's it's yeah, a monthly rats. subscription for for a few hundred, for several hundred or a thousand dollars, right? It's so the cost and the economics mm-hmm. have changed drastically, and that's because of all this innovation that's been going on in the market. And yeah, payback used to be three to four years, and now it's months. So. Um, it's just becoming some of that will end up being table stakes, right? Because mm-hmm. you're just going to have to do that with the the cost of labor and labor availability throughout the country. Yeah. Uh, so definitely exciting times on that. Yeah. And to add to that, I think it's also the brands that are now seeing the the ability to get a WMS, right? Like there was this uh, fear that if you want to get a WMS, it's going to be multi-million dollars kind of an expense. But they're realizing, hey, there are WMSs that can actually serve smaller startups and smaller warehouses that are quite affordable. And it is way better than manually tracking on spreadsheets and documents and sticky notes and having people run all over the place and still not being able to reconcile things. So that's been another thing that we're seeing like just people realizing the the amount of you know democratization of technology that we've seen over the last few years and also i think ai is going to change that quite a bit i mean we're seeing some stirrings of uh, folks in the supply chain space trying to build out and build in ai and ml into their solutioning so um quite interesting how that's going to play out as well yeah, I I just have to say something that you just mentioned about the brands that use the WMSs or as as an example. I think that's where the biggest opportunity space happens to be, right? Like, and, and I personally want to be on a mission to help as many brands as possible in just figuring out their supply chain pieces, right? Like there is very mature brands with some really good leaders that are doing really well, but that brand that's just about to break out, right? Or they have just broken out to, to that next level. I think what I see more often is like using whatever they used when they used to run something in their garage or the first result that they found on a Google search for the problem that they were facing around inventory management or WMS, right? the landscape has drastically evolved, right? If you want ERP focused around e-commerce, yes, it's really easily accessible for less than a couple thousand dollars a month. That actually is more than an ERP. It will do your WMS, your shop floor technology. It will do your finance, et cetera, right? And on the other side, if you wanted more on the fulfillment and warehouse execution side, yeah, there is a WMS, but it can also do your order management and transportation Mm -hmm. management. And it, it covers the breadth use the right solution to operate your building. Someone I recently spoke to, I mean, it's an amazingly run warehouse, but the amount of money that they spent on their technology, because they tried to just like build on top of layers and layers of additional code that was completely unnecessary while they could have just like taken a solution for a couple grand. I think that's where the opportunity really lies, right? Like, um, again, not, not, not saying that that wasn't the right thing. That was the right thing for then. But if you want to scale, tech is out there. Just mm-hmm. use the right thing for it to do the job that it needs to do for you. Focus on design, focus on bringing in the right tech rather yeah. than just keep building on top of things, right? Like if you are a brand, your tech is not as much of value Mm-hmm. than what you are doing as a brand, right? So Exactly. Yeah, and I think this is something we internally talk about a lot. The 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 tech that helped you scale up to $10 million in revenue is not the same tech that's going to help you get to 100. You're going to have to make some adjustments and you're going to have to do prep yourself and and prepare to kind of meet that kind of scale. Um and then other than Dan, I think one of the things we should definitely touch on here, and this is something that we probably get pulled into uh, on a weekly basis, is integrations. I mean, it's not just about having a good, robust system. We're starting to see more and more companies tapping into the power of integrations and making their own solution kind of go the extra mile by utilizing all of the different ways that they can integrate into other ecosystem of uh, supply chain integrations. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think an interesting stat I recently saw was 10 years ago, less than 50% of the Fortune 500 used a 3PL. Today, over 90%. So how that relates to integrations is as more companies are, are partnering with 3PLs in the space, the opportunity to do a one-to-many integration is something where we see a lot of focus taking place. So a lot of these uh, new tech solutions, they are they're looking for that that way to integrate with many customers through 3PL. So what does that mean? That means they typically have to integrate into more a more enterprise level infrastructure, supply chain infrastructure, even if they're working with a SMB, a startup or, or a small business, because that 3PL, again, sits with enterprise level WMS, OMS and, and technology. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out, but there's massive opportunity um, in this space. And I know, Nanad, this is a huge passion of yours. Yeah, no, I I, I just got it. So I, I want to break this kind of into two, right? One is enterprises. And, and that number that you just mentioned, the good thing about that is most large enterprises have good integration solution in place, even though they might not be using a 3PL, the chances are they have a good internal integration team and a good tool to make integrations happen because they have been doing it with their ERPs, talking to finance systems, talking to human resource systems, et cetera, right? For years. And so you add 3PLs or your logistics arm. Yeah, you need a little bit of strategic decision making of like how you are going to build that out, but they have the underlying foundations available. The thing that gets me is the mid-market brands, right? Like brands that are scaled. Here's the story I see over and over again. You get the tech guy that you knew that came in and started <laughs> building a whole bunch of stuff for you. And now you got a, a whole ton of spaghetti sitting under the hood that's actually running your business and complex business logic that's sitting there, right? That is running on because if you if you start in a really startup environment, the startup dude that you end up getting or due date that you end up getting is going to be <laughs> someone that is more in tuned with, I'm going to use, I don't use that Java or C sharp as code because I am so cool. I'm going to use this obscure language to build my application. Guess what ends up happening when that dude goes? Nobody knows that language and you can find people out in the market to be able to do that, right? Like that's one set of problem. The other is, you make things more complicated. Ideal way, right? And this this is a part that I've seen repeated over and over again. Look at how the industry does things and try to modernize, but try to follow standard practices. And this is where even be it on the application side or on the integration side, this is something that you see time and time again. Like don't, don't reinvent the wheel altogether. Right. We all know what a structure of an order or a structure of a shipment is supposed to look like. It's been around for decades. Mm -hmm. Add 15, 20 additional feeds, fields, right? But don't try and restructure the whole thing in a way that no one else understands in the market, right? So hire talent with experience if you can very early on when you are early stage and when you are growing and your integration needs grow. Just like everything else, like you choose a WMS, you choose an OMS, you choose an ERP, and then as you grow, you need the next one. Even at early stage, try and bring in an integration tool that's whose job it is to manage integrations, right? There is a whole ton, MuleSoft, Delbium, Boomi, right? Like there is Jitterbit, a, a whole ton. Find great partners, find great tools. It's going to help you in the long run. Don't write code for the sake of writing code because I love that saying from the uh, uh, CFO of Microsoft, let's not build golden toilets. <laughs> Just because you can build it, don't go build it. Unless you're right? Kanye West. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So on that note, um, I'll move on to the last topic of conversation. Um, I don't think we could complete this podcast by without talking about your predictions and trends and expectations for peak season to come. And also would love to get your thoughts on uh, and advice for 3PLs and brands out there that are listening to the podcast as well. I think 
peak season, I think we're, is going to be okay. Um, I haven't said that for a couple of years, um, <laughs> but I think, I think it seems like infrastructure capacity expectations on volume seem kind of in line. So I, I'm not, a, I don't foresee any huge like peak season is hard. It's hard mm-hmm. time, hard times 10, mm-hmm. but I think, I think we should be in a generally good place. Um, but coming out of peak again, I what I'm so optimistic about is whether it's 3PLs, enterprise level retailers, brand CPG, all the planning that needs to take place to make an impact in 2024 is already happening. So I think the the takeaway is don't wait. Don't wait for the you know the end of peak season to start planning for your 2024 the time to plan and map out what you're going to do to solve strategic initiatives is actually today you get you know you get the funding approved you get your c suite board approval um and then you you get at it so again what is different for what I've seen in the past is we're not in this kind of reactive state anymore. Mm-hmm. Organizations are being very, very proactive. Um, so bullishly optimistic uh, for 2024 and cautiously optimistic for 2023 peak season. I think I'm, uh, I'll say this. I'll agree with you on the front. You got to split peak into two parts. How are we going to do execution during peak, right? Like, are we going to be successful in shipping stuff out and having inventory and all of that stuff? And then the second is the revenue side. Mm-hmm. And I, I I discussed this previously where from a revenue side, don't do the quarter over quarter calculation or annualized calculation, but this is the new reality. And I think everyone's kind of adjusted to that. So I'm not too worried about that part. And also I'll say that uh, on the execution side, I think we are just going to do really fine this year. Like I, I, that one, I can, I'm highly optimistic that we are going to do really fine this year. And if you don't, uh, give us a call. <laughs> like you got a problem, but this year shouldn't be bad at all. Um, and as far as 2024 is concerned, yes, I am very bullish about everything that I'm seeing. There is certain bellwether that you can see how enterprises are moving and they are moving in a very strategic manner. And I would say the, the, the same thing should be applicable on the, the, the brand side and on the, on the e-commerce brands and digital native brands. It's like, look at what they are doing. And if I was to advise you, yes, if you got strategic motions to put in place to Dan's point, put them in right now because they will bear fruits very quickly mm-hmm. that you are ready for your March peak if you have one or your April right. peak if you have one, right? So, um, and your projects are much quicker and faster to execute than some of the enterprise grade solutions that might take two years, right? Like our, our projects that we start right now will not see the light of day until 2025, actually. Mm-hmm. Great yeah. points, guys. Thank you guys so much. This was a lot of fun. And I think uh, just based on the fact that time has flown by, I think you guys had fun as well. I hope I wasn't too tough on you guys. No, no this was awesome. awesome. It was easy. Okay, awesome. All right. So you guys might be seeing more of this uh, this format in the future. So Dan, to your standard closing question, um, I'll follow your lead and ask you guys, uh, how can our audience learn more about you? How can they keep up with you on social media? Please share the details. Awesome. Thank you, Hershita. Uh, obviously, fulfillmentiq.com is our website. So please check out the uh, check that out. A lot of services that we provide, a lot of content as well, too. We're really big on sharing insights. So check out the blog. Check out all the content that we put out. A lot of really cool white papers available as well. And where we're most active is on LinkedIn. So check us out at, uh, at Fulfillment IQ on LinkedIn. Again, uh, Harshita and her team and, and everyone at Fulfillment IQ do an awesome job pushing out content daily. And uh, yeah, I think that'd be the best way. Uh, certainly on LinkedIn too. If you want to reach out, just hit me up, send me a DM and would love to chat. Amazing. And over to you, Nanad, what what are the kind of uh, problems and challenges you tend to work on and how can folks get in touch with you? Product and strategy. If you are looking at uh, solutioning an internal product that you have, um, 
you want to talk to me. If you have a technology or architecture question, uh, I'm the person you want to talk to. Uh, if you have questions about what technology should we adopt in the market, you want to talk to me uh, from a WMS, OMS, TMS, ERP, integration solutions, et cetera, standpoint. Uh, I've seen it in various different industries, worked on various different industries, uh, built many capabilities, so I can definitely help on those. And yeah, please uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, also, uh, you could reach out to us through uh, any of us, actually. So if I don't respond, uh, message her, she's out there and be like, hey, Nanat's not responding. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Thank you guys again. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, Harshida. Thanks, guys. Hi, I'm Ninada Charya, CEO and co-founder of Fulfillment IQ. And I'm here with... Dan Call, CRO and partner at Fulfillment IQ. We're the team behind the Ecom Logistics Podcast. Our mission is to provide you with genuine insights from our work alongside logistics leaders to help you improve your supply chain. In the Ecom Logistics Podcast, we share the knowledge and the insights we've gained from working alongside amazing brands, retailers, 3PLs, and VCs, so you can make the most out of your supply chain journey. If you like what you're hearing, we truly appreciate your support with a five-star rating on your favorite podcasting channel. Your feedback not only keeps us going, but also helps others find the podcast. If you think Fulfillment IQ can assist you, or if you have an idea related to logistics, just reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm always up for a chat and ready to explore new possibilities together. Stay tuned to the Ecom Logistics Podcast on your favorite podcast platform for fresh and practical insights into e-commerce and logistics. Until next time, let's keep making a difference in logistics together.